Hello, I am Rosemary Powell, Executive Director of the Toronto Community Benefits Network, and I'll be your moderator for today's session on powering the shift towards green, caring, and inclusive economy. I'm incredibly pleased to be a part of this year's Progress Summit and to be having this conversation with three of the foremost experts who are leading work locally, nationally, and internationally to help pave the way for an economy that is inclusive and transformative. Like the work that I'm doing with the Toronto Community Benefits Network, they are addressing the challenges of access to good jobs, local economic development, and neighborhood revitalization with a lens of social and environmental justice. There are so many intersectionalities with their efforts, and today we will explore what tools and strategies these leaders and their organizations are undertaking to actualize these bold social objectives. So I'd like you to meet Christine Bergeron, who is president and CEO of Van City, Canada's largest community credit union, a world-class banking institution that is using their power to build the well-being of people at the same time ensuring the long-term sustainability of the communities in which they live and work. David Miller, Director of International Diplomacy, C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group, where he is responsible for supporting mayors in their climate leadership and for building a global movement for socially equitable action to mitigate and adapt to climate change. David is also known as one of our beloved mayors of Toronto from 2003 to 2010. And he is the author of Solved, How the World's Great Cities Are Fixing the Climate, Changes, uh, climate Crisis. Samantha Smith, who is director of the Just Transition Center, which was established by the International Trade Union Confederation and partners to help unions and their allies get good plans for just transition at all levels. So to get started, Christine, I would like to start with you. And for your opening remarks, please take a few minutes to introduce oh, yourself and your work to our audience, and then to explain uh, as we hopefully transition out of the pandemic and move towards a, uh, a just recovery, what's at stake and what is your top priority in terms of your work in the world right now? After which I will ask David Miller and Samantha to do the same. Great, thanks very much, Rosemary. Uh, as stated, so my name is Christine Bergeau. I'm president and CEO at Van City. We are based uh, here in Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, and I am gathering and speaking to you from the unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, uh, represented by the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. To, to answer the question, I think of what's at stake, uh, broadly speaking, from my perspective, is the economy of the future. You know, it's clear um, that we can't go back to pre-COVID economy. It was one that wasn't working for most people and it was causing great harm to the planet. So we do need to transition to an economy that's both clean and fair. Um, and equity really does need to be a critical component of our response to the climate crisis. You know, we really have to ensure everyone can be part of the transition. And that does mean not leaving behind those who are affected by climate action. You know, for example, people in communities that are currently uh, or that currently rely on high emission industries um, the oil patch of course being the more prominent example and it does mean enabling those that can't transition on their own um, because we can't just have a transition for the rich or for those that are career mobile or those who can work from home um, and it does also mean making sure that those who really are the least responsible for the crisis don't bear the brunt of the changes so we do need to lift people, uh, people up who currently are in more precarious and lower paying sector jobs and those who are already marginalized in our community. And that can be done, for example, by ensuring a living wage, um, if you're an employer, just as one example. And it will require system change. Um, achieving those changes are going to require all stakeholders working together from my perspective. So private sector with government um, and our work at Van City really is to do whatever we can to help drive that type of transition to, one to a sustainable economy you know we we use the tools of banking that's what we have at our disposal to empower our members um, as a cooperative um, we have over half a million members that's a pretty strong financial force uh, to, to make some of this change and then also by advocating um, and working with other partners on necessary systemic changes so that's currently the, the focus of our work is how do we use the tools of banking to help empower members and then how do we use our voice 
um, to really help um, with other partners along the way. Now that's wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing that. And uh, your worship, uh, would you uh, talk about your work with C4D? Thanks, uh, Rosemary. David is is fine, but thank you. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I think I should first give a, just a quick background on C40 Climate Leadership Group for those who aren't familiar with our work. C40 is a coalition originally of 40, but now of almost 100 mayors of the world's largest cities, chaired currently by Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti, who have come together to use their voices and their actions uh, to help the world avoid dangerous climate change. It was originally started in 2005 by uh, then London Mayor Ken Livingston. And the organization has been really effective in helping raise the ambition uh, of the world to, to act with the urgency required, although of course we're not anywhere near there yet. And one of the challenges we see with climate action is that its impact is inequitable. It's caused by the, the richest and its impacts are often felt by the least well off, both globally between countries and within countries and cities. For example, uh, Hurricane Sandy, which arguably was a climate related megastorm in New York City, within a couple of weeks, Wall Street had recovered. Uh, seven years later, low income communities um, with many newcomers to the United States in Queens had still not recovered from the devastation of Hurricane Sandy. So there are huge equitable impacts of climate. Um, and there's a second parallel challenge, which is if mayors are to remain as leaders on climate change and have the political support to do what's necessary to dramatically reduce emissions from cities, they need the support of people. And that means all people. So the programs to address climate change, to mitigate and to adapt have to be developed with everybody, including those who are from marginalized uh, communities. So at C40, because we're not just about the voices of our mayors, we're about action. We have uh, developed a series of pilot projects in partnership with the, the Just Transition Center and Labor in five countries, nine cities, to build working models of what a just transition could be to ensure that the investments required to address climate change and clean energy, clean buildings, clean waste, clean transport, uh, benefit everybody, not just some people. And what we're seeing at this post-pandemic moment is a coming together of themes because of course, uh, COVID has starkly revealed the inequities in society. And often it's the least paid workers who are deemed to be essential in our society. So at this moment, when there's a very significant recognition of the importance of public investments, ensuring that everyone benefit, uh, it's opportune to ensure that those public COVID recovery investments not only invest in climate change, but do it in an equitable way with equitable outcomes. And our hope is to create these working models that can spread globally like other work C40 has done in the past, for example, on electric buses, which is now a global standard for public transport. We're hoping we help create global standards for equitable employment with these kinds of investments that are necessary if the world is going to avoid climate catastrophe. Thank you. Samantha? Yeah, thanks, Rosemary. And of course, I can only support the things that both Christine and David have said. We're pretty excited about our partnership with C40, not least because public sector employees, municipal employees are you know, a strong area for trade unions in most of the world's countries. And we're also really looking forward to building some models at local level that then can be then can be scaled up. But I think it might be helpful just to say a bit about where where are we right now? Because in some countries, yes, we're coming out of the pandemic, but I work globally. The International Trade Union Confederation represents more than 200 million organized workers in 163 countries. Yeah, it's 163 now. And a lot of a lot of our sisters and brothers, comrades in different countries will not see a vaccine until sometime next year, maybe towards the end of the year. So one of the things that, that is still at stake is that in a lot of places in the world, we're still in a pandemic and 
the, the risk is that richer countries that have vaccines are going to be emerging from this pandemic more or less starting now, whereas poorer countries or global south countries that don't have access to vaccines, they're going to be where they are um, in and out of lockdown, people getting sick and dying for a much longer period. So um, the, you know, one of the top priorities is actually global vaccine equity. Because without that, we're not going to get a just and global recovery. We're not going to get a just transition either. Um, another thing about where we are is that over the last year or last year in 2020, hundreds of millions of jobs disappeared globally, both formal jobs and also, also informal jobs. And it looks as if the same thing is going to happen this year. But again, with some country, you know, people, working people in some countries doing much better than working people in others. And the last thing is, as David said, you know, if you look at who has lost work during the pandemic and during this historic global economic crisis that we're still in, it's low paid workers, it's women who've had to withdraw from the workforce because there's no care available for children or for elders. Um, it's, really, it's really people who already didn't have a ton of rights, who already uh, didn't have great conditions of work, who have been hit the hardest by, by the pandemic and by the, by the global recession. So for us, what's at stake is a new social contract because as both David and Christine have said, you know, we can't rebuild using the tools that got us to this point where inequality and poverty have increased dramatically um, during COVID-19. And so we need a new relationship between government, between um, employers, whether they're public sector or private sector, and between, uh, between citizens, working people, families. And that new relationship has to start actually with decent jobs, because the only way we're going to come out of this crisis is for all jobs to be good. So that means that we can't just kind of switch on the economy that we had at the start of this, um, try to create a lot of temporary jobs with poor wages and conditions. No, we need to have living wages. People need to have the right to organize into collective bargaining at work, and we need to rebuild some of the power that we have lost as, as trade unions during the crisis. I think the, the other important part about a, a jobs-based recovery, decent jobs, is that we also have to have just transition because we can't switch on the high emitting economy that we've had for the last you know, 100 years um, with increasing emissions we're going to have to switch on an economy that is transitioning. And we're going to have to have a really active state, lots of support for people, both in terms of care, healthcare, but also income support and training, because the speed of change right now, uh, even now without as that much action by governments or employers is really fast. That's what we hear from our workers and members. So we need to move fast, but we need to support people in change with the just transition so that we're together in this process and we're not leaving behind large numbers of people. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, as we move to this just transition and an inclusive recovery from this pandemic through this new social contract that you speak about, um, I'd like to hear from uh, David about how cities can lead in this work. Could you please share some specific examples of work you have seen or engaged with that inspires you? I did look um, through some of the uh, your book and you do give some really good examples that I'd love for you to share. Yeah, yeah thanks Rosemary. I, uh, I think this is a, a really important point. Um, I think we all agree on the theory we need a just transition. We need equal employment. People need to be paid a living wage. The question for me is what examples and what actions really help create that kind of society? Um, and I, I think we can see some really interesting examples from city-based leadership um, and, and a little bit for some others. So from a city-based leadership perspective and coming from an organization that uh, is trying to address climate change. Our mayors uh, 
are doing everything they can to address climate in an equitable way, particularly through employment issues and through thinking through uh, the equitable impacts of climate action and the possibilities and working with people uh, and their representatives from uh, marginalized groups and low income groups. So for example, uh, Los Angeles has brought a program to low income communities who often live in places with really, really poor air quality and then suffer from the health impacts of that. Uh, to uh, electrify transportation and, uh, and have provided, essentially provided subsidies for people to use short-term car rentals with electric vehicles. I think the program's called Blue LA or New York City, uh, which pre-pandemic um, had created a green jobs core to get the training and jobs um, that are going to be plentiful because of its work on uh, doing significant energy retrofits in buildings. So their policy on the energy retrofits was achieving climate goals, but their implementation was achieving social justice goals. And to me, that's at the heart of the necessary action, thinking through those policies and actions uh, together. Lots more examples, Seoul, Korea, at the heart of its recovery from the pandemic, putting a big energy retrofit program in buildings, uh, 22,000 people going to be employed. Uh, C40 itself is, is working to think, how can we ensure women get jobs in construction? And they're probably the leading program in the world is right here at home in British Columbia, uh, where the BC government has signed a community benefits agreement with the trades that has uh, significant, includes significant opportunities to train women in jobs in the building trades on public projects. And I think it's that kind of structural change that we need that creates real jobs for real people and sets the benchmark that those jobs are paying a living wage so that people can live in dignity. Thank you very much. Indeed, infrastructure spending will fuel the economy post pandemic. And Canada is investing billions of taxpayer funds. Uh, Christine Bergeron, how does finance and social finance help with these sticky challenges? What are some examples that inspires you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, one of the most um, exciting recent developments in the business world has been the steady rise of values and impact as drivers of why businesses are started and how they're run. You know, the consideration of ESG, so environmental and social impact and good governance, is becoming embedded into business models. You know, it's no longer just an investment tool for niche responsible investors, which it certainly was when I started my career. And, and so it is starting to filter into larger, more established businesses and even into the financial sector. You know, for example, Van City is a member of the Global Alliance for Banking on Values. So this is an international alliance of banks committed to values driven banking. Um, it's got 64 members, uh, 16 strategic partners, 39 countries, uh, 60 million customers, and over um, 210 billion of combined assets under management. So, you know, we are seeing uh, more and more of this coming forward. Um, and, you know, we've certainly been at the forefront of the trend, although, you know, it wasn't necessarily something we realized at the time. We, we did the work because it was the right thing to do, and it's what our membership asks us to do. Um, and we've been one of Canada's ESG um, pioneers for several decades. We, we don't simply use ESG criteria to you know, think about excluding stocks and portfolios that we manage, but we actually apply it much more holistically to how we reduce harm and increase positive impact for people and communities. So several years ago, we adopted a similar approach throughout our business called ethical principles for business relationships. And it's a framework, you know, it's certainly not perfect, but it's a framework where we assess businesses, you know, that want to get a loan from us. Um, and it's not just the financial criteria. So we also look at whether by working with them and together that we can increase the positive impact or decrease harm uh, for people in our community. And then we work with those businesses to achieve that. And what we did um, was one way of integrated reporting as well. So we, we have an integrated report in our annual report. It's social and environmental as well as financial. And all of that is in um, our business model. Um, and so when we started adopting this approach, it was quite pioneering. Um, it's much easier to do this today because ESG has been developing to the point where it can provide a bit more guidance to businesses on how to enhance their impact. Um, and I think the key to its success for us was accepting 
um, and living the approach um, that what makes good business is not maximizing profit, but it's making enough profit while maximizing impact. Um, and I do think that this can definitely, you know, scale beyond Van City, but it will take um, deliberate uh, leadership, right? Because, uh, you know, you need to then go back to shareholders and everyone's got a different construct. As a cooperative, it's a different perspective. Um, but I do think that all of these are pieces that can scale. And certainly it's exciting to see, um, to see the trends. Thank you very much. And uh, Samantha, how can unions lead in this work as we make a just transition, including how can they ensure historically disadvantaged communities and equity seeking groups are centered in their work? What are some good examples that inspires you? Well, there are a lot of, there, there are many, so I'll just give you a few. I do want to give a little shout out though for the community benefits advocates and agreements in Canada, because I have to say when I'm internationally, when I'm working with, with unions in other countries and I'm asked a question like this, I lift up what BC has done, but also what Toronto has done. So just to say that the work of the building trades and, and local government is, uh, is standard setting on exactly this issue with apprenticeships that are bringing, giving people skills and bringing them into good jobs and a lifetime of prosperity, but also union membership. Um, so just to give, just to give a few examples of what unions can do. I mean, I would say that um, in our movement, I've seen a huge change over the last five years that also unions in fossil fuel extraction, um, unions in heavy industry, unions in construction and transport. And by the way, we work only with unions from high emitting countries and high emitting sectors, that all of our comrades and sisters and brothers in these different sectors understand that climate change is a thing. Some are more accepting than others, but we all understand the change is coming and we need to do something about it. So one thing that, that uh, most unions are doing is that we're engaging in just transition. And maybe some people in your audience have heard of just transition. You don't know exactly what it is. Um, it's a term that comes initially mostly from the trade union movement. And um, after a couple of decades of you know, advocacy and struggle internationally and nationally. We actually have UN rules um, under the Paris Agreement on Climate Change and then also in the International Labor Organization about what just transition is. And really it starts with unions, employers and governments, depending a little bit on like what country you're in. Sometimes First Nations are also at the table in the same role as governments. Um, and then on the other hand, you also have this deep process of stakeholder engagement, which is communities and civil societies. So you have one, sometimes two very powerful processes where people sit together and they negotiate the future. And just to be clear, you know, just transition is not just, again, we're not switching on the economy that we had before. We want an economy where all jobs are good. So not just that energy worker, people who work in extractive industries today have good jobs tomorrow. We also want all jobs in the economy, including jobs that because of patriarchy are traditionally held by women, care jobs. We want those jobs to be good and family supporting too. Um, and Just Transition is about this process of negotiating what governments and employers are going to do to create jobs and be sure that there's a pathway for every single person, either in work or for people who are unable to work or not working for one reason or another to have a decent life. So whether that's pension and health care or income support or parental leave, like all of those things are part of Just Transition. I'll give one in, ex, inspiring example. Um, so we're working a lot right now with our comrades in Brazil, in CUT Brazil, which is the largest trade union confederation in Latin America, has a proud history affiliated with the Workers' Party, which brought Lula to power, um, now in opposition because of the genocidal Bolsonaro regime. And CUT um, is working with a little, little help from us um, with the governors of the states in the northeast of Brazil 
to come up with institutions and plans for just transition. Those states have been a site of oil development and extraction, mostly on land um, because of the pandemic and, and other reasons, those jobs are disappearing. And so CUT is working with the local government and also with some of the employers in exactly this process of negotiating what the new jobs are gonna be. How can we make sure the new jobs are good jobs? And for us, how can we organize workers so that they then have collective voice to demand their rights and so that people who today are not union members can enjoy the benefits and the power of, of union membership. So it's pretty inspiring to work with my comrades who are in an awful situation uh, targeted by the national government, um, sort of runaway uh, epidemic of COVID in their region and in their country. And nonetheless, at the same time, are doing this amazing, powerful work on climate change and just transition. No, incredible. And um, rethinking the economic outcomes and measurements of success to reflect our values and vision for our world. Um, could you um, discuss, um, Christine, about how Van City is doing that? Sure. <laughs> um, I, you know, I think um, broadly, you know, I think the key to achieving it is really getting all financial institutions to come on board. But maybe I'll start with, you know, what we're doing in terms of trying to really link, you know, climate change and inequality as, as that one example. You know, this past January, we did announce several climate commitments that are guiding um, what we're going to be doing to respond to the climate crisis. And, uh, you know, one is is getting our loan portfolio. So that what you know, which we fund our, our financed emissions to net zero by 2040. But if, as part of this within the five, you know, what's really key for us is um, really being committed to providing banking and other solutions to help people who are affected by the climate emergency, um, as we've been talking about. And so the commitment really recognizes that it's not going to hit everyone the same way, um, that climate, the climate crisis won't. Um, and, and we know that we need to really help think about those tools. And so for us, that's tailoring products to give more members the ability to afford climate actions. Um, it'll also be finding, you know, we don't have all of them yet, creative ways to support initiatives in the community that do reduce or avoid um, emissions. And I think in both of those spheres, there's a lot of learning that we need to do, um, both in terms of what the needs and the gaps are that need filling and where we can step in and help to fill them directly ourselves. So we have, you know, for example, we're partnering with affordable housing developers in Vancouver to really look at innovative ideas for reducing the emissions that are part of the building process. You know, our funding is helping to test um, these kind of ideas, see if they're scalable. Um, and in doing so, we're also trying to understand whether and how uh, we can better finance those types of innovations uh, going forward. So it's relatively new territory um, for financial institutions, but we are quite excited um, to be exploring it and thinking about how these solutions could then work for other financial institutions as well. You know, we're we're a thirty billion dollar financial institution. We we do a lot, but certainly we need all financial institutions to come on board to really start to see um, the change that I think is going to be needed. Right, and um, altogether, the money that flows into the economy through through different financial institutions is large, and really they do have the power to boost certain economic activities and slow other other ones down and um, and so i think you know that question specifically right on how um how are we going to really achieve that vision i mean it's what we do every day so for us it's really within our strategy um, i don't believe a business you know at least our perspective here is i'm not sure a business can be successful if the communities and the people around it aren't thriving um, and so we are seeing though that others around us are also starting to take part. So we do need a system, right? Regulators are moving to force higher standards of GHG accounting reporting uh, for financial institutions. Investors and shareholders are increasingly pushing financial institutions to move away from emissions heavy financing. And so there is more underwriting happening and, and more focus on green innovation. And the market is increasingly disincentivizing emissions heavy investments as well. So I think, you know, we do need the full system to come together. We won't achieve our vision simply on our own, um, but certainly we'll do what we can to, to spark a lot of that, uh, a lot of that innovation. Thank you, Samantha. Everyone from the IMF to President Biden has called for green and just transition. 
who needs to come on board and to commit to operationalizing this vision and and how how do we do this yeah well i mean as i that's the big question hey how do you get people to the table some of whom don't actually want to be there at least at the outset um a lot of what a lot of what we do is actually to support trade unions in setting up the table, setting up the institution of social dialogue if they don't have it. So in some countries, you have this institution. South Africa has a constitutional social dialogue table where they address things like just transition. But in other countries, the institutions are a lot weaker or they don't exist. Um, just, some, just some points about who needs to be there and how do you get them there. Um, of course, we unions, we want to be there and we should be there because without us, it's it's not just transition. It's something else that can be good, but not just transition. Um, governments at different levels, David has talked about these pilot projects that we're doing where we're working intentionally with city governments and mayors to set up these dialogues with employers, unions, employers, city governments, um, but then also to be sure that there is this space and deep engagement with with civil society and with communities. Um, how do you get the, the reluctant ones there? So that would be employers or um, as Christine was kind of hinting, you know, some of the investors. With the employers, what we're seeing is that for some of them, and just to take the oil and gas sector, which is a sector that I personally work a lot with. I mean, the oil and gas sector is facing big change right now. I think there's just no question about it. And whether the big change comes, you know, this year continues as it has during the pandemic or whether there's a sort of burst in demand, but then after that, we have to deal with all the really hard issues, like change is here. And we have a ton of members who are employed in that sector. Um, the way to get those companies to the table, some of them are actually approaching us. So that's one interesting thing is the companies who were sort of like, no, we're not gonna discuss just transition or like, no, now we have to think about this, is by um, talking to them about the interests that we, that, that we all share, right? So we don't want companies to go under from one day to the next and put a ton of people out of work. Right? We don't want to do that. In an ideal scenario, every employer, every sector will transform and will be both offer both rights at work and good conditions, but will also transform its asset base and its mode of production. In the case of oil and gas companies, this means that they're going to be transitioning away from fossil fuel assets and progressively adding uh, renewable energy, adding hydrogen and other things into, into their asset base. Um, and the way that you the way that you get them to the table is just by saying that this is the process we want. We want to help you manage this transition. We want to help you do it in a way so that um, you uh, continue. We all continue to prosper in the future. And we have tools and methods. We have a process. We have an organized workforce that is ready to help you do that and to rebuild the company. And you'd be surprised how effective that is. Absolutely. I totally agree. And, uh, you know, this is what we're seeing as well in our community benefits movement. David, your book talks about, you know, the awesome power of cities, especially in their planning process and, uh, you know, the level of uh, resident engagement and grassroots up uh, kinds of interventions that can happen. Could you speak a little bit more as to uh, how um, communities and how, especially those who have been marginalized or exploited, discriminated against in our current economy, how can they have voice and power? Yeah, um, I'll give a couple examples, uh, Rosemary. And, and I think first, the background for this is that the best cities, certainly the members of C40 and a number of others have climate plans that do their part of what's necessary to keep the world on a 1.5 degree trajectory. And for Canadian cities and North American and European, that's roughly uh, peaking emissions uh, by now, by the end of 2020, uh, having them by, uh, or at least a fair share of having them by 2030 and net zero by 2050, roughly speaking. 
And the very best cities in those plans develop strategies in partnership with low income and other marginalized communities like communities of newcomers, for example, who often don't have a vote and therefore are marginalized in all sorts of ways from uh, political power. Uh, so an example, of, oh, and finally, one thing I should say parenthetically is those plans address emissions from buildings, from transport, from uh, waste management and how, from how we generate electricity. And the best plans are highly successful. Toronto, for example, greenhouse gas emissions are about 33% below what they were in 1990 as a result of the city's plan developed in 2007 and the closing of the Lakeview coal-fired plant. So the plans can work. The very best cities include people in the plans and think about how these climate plans affect equity. So uh, as Sam was saying, process matters, actions matter as well. And I'll give two quick examples, uh, if I might, Rosemary. The first is, is yeah. Toronto. Our, our climate plan in 2007 called Changes in the Air, which has been updated uh, uh, a few year, 10 years later, a few years ago, um, by, by the current city government, uh, had a big focus on building a transit network in Toronto. That transit network was by light rail because it was affordable to build an entire network rather than pieces of a network. And when we did the public consultations for that, I actually took the bus uh, in, in Scarborough, in the east end of Toronto, very early in the morning to talk to people who were taking a bus route that was due to be replaced by rapid transit and spoke to them. And one of the people on it said to me, you know, Mayor Miller, why are you on my bus at six o'clock in the morning? I said, I wanted to talk to you about the Shepherd East light rail. And she said, what's that? And I explained. And she said, that would be great. That would really help me. And I said, why? And she said, well, I'm going to work. And to get to work, uh, I take two buses till the subway, then another subway to the subway, and then another two buses. Because she worked at Pearson Airport from Scarborough, which is about 43 kilometers. That was her morning job. She had an afternoon job as a cleaner at the Royal York Hotel. So building rapid transit would have given her back a huge amount of time in her day, maybe as much as an hour. And that would have allowed her, for example, to go back to school to upgrade skills so she could get one full-time job, or perhaps even go to the public meetings where you know elected officials listened to the community and debated whether to in fact build that light rail or not. It would allow her to participate democratically uh, in, in the city life. Incredibly powerful and important. Another real example, I'll just wrap up here, is Lisbon, who in response to the pandemic, not only are building rapid transit at a time that, you know, transit services declined in many cities, they're actually building new rapid transit with green and just recovery funds from the EU, and they're repurposing short-term rentals in the core of the city for uh, low-income working people, who no longer have to commute. So they're getting all sorts of benefits from that, not just climate, social justice, inclusion, low, low rentals. It's a complicated thing they've had to do, but a very good example of the power of aligning this climate work with social justice initiatives so you achieve multiple goals. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I'd like to thank Christine, Samantha, and David for your incredible and deep perspectives on what changes are on the way needed or hoped for uh, in your sector to tackle these challenging issues of our world and our time. Community benefits agreements um, are really creating change here at the local level, but also federally. We just got uh, the federal government to, uh, to, to accept, uh, to commit to a $12 billion transfer uh, for public transit in Toronto, and it will be built with community benefits agreements. And these are the kinds of policies that we want to see broad scale that will help to fuel this movement. Can you, as we're uh, at wrapping up the session, uh, share your perspective with the audience, you know, those policymakers and activists and political representatives, union leaders um, about, um, you know, what, you know, what they can do to really impact change in a positive and sustaining way. Who would and, like to go first? I'm sorry, right? yes, please. Thank you very much. So I, I think three things. 
people should keep using their voice. It's incredibly powerful. From a climate perspective, I've heard from all sorts of engineering firms, for example, who are trying to achieve green standards, that they do that because when they interview uh, younger workers, the first question they ask is, what are you doing for the environment? So people's voices are incredibly powerful. Um, and in using that voice, uh, uh, a green and just recovery from COVID and community benefits are incredibly important. And I, I just would mention again, um, and it's partly because in a volunteer capacity, I'm involved with the work, but the BC approach to community benefits, which is legislated and requires public procurements, well, certain public procurements uh, where feasible uh, to use a community benefits approach is really powerful. Um, second thing is people should use use their actions. Um, including, you know, how and where you bank is your money going to, to green and just solutions. And the third thing is, of course, uh, political action. You know, people seem to not talk about that enough, but it really matters who we elect. And the organization I represent has terrific progressive mayors around the world who are progressive on climate, on social inclusion, on, on community benefits, on migration, on other issues. And they're only able to do their work because... Uh, they were elected. So I, I think if we use our voice, our actions, and our vote, we can start to build a world where um, we focus an economy not around growth, but around the results for people and for everybody. Thank you. Samantha, would you like to go next? Well, sure. Well, first, Rosemary, let me just congratulate you for your great victory in this enormous community benefits agreement, and also for getting public transport for the people of Toronto. Right, this is gonna help a lot of people's lives get better. As David described, public transport is probably the number one poverty alleviation measure that we have in any city or urban area. So that's really huge. Um, and beyond fighting for more community benefits agreements, you know, we need labor standards in this government money that is, that is coming out on a conveyor belt right now. Because when that money um, hits the labor market, it can get invested in things that are good for working class and poor people and good for workers, or it can get invested in things that aren't going to produce a lot of good jobs. And more than anything else right now, we need good jobs. So that would be number one. Get the labor standards attached to the recovery money um, and to the infrastructure spend and do it at the highest level that you can so that you don't have to fight the fight for those standards on the ground um, at every workplace by yourselves. The second thing is what, we, what I opened with, which is vaccine equity. So we're not safe, we're not done with this pandemic. It's not done with us until every person is vaccinated. So if you're politically active, great if you use your voice on this. And the third is related to the first point about labor standards and recovery spending. Um, work for just transition. If you're not a union member, go join a union. Talk to your union about what your union is doing on just transition. Talk to your elected leaders. Talk to your employer. What are they gonna do to bring down emissions? What is their plan? And are they making that plan with workers or are they gonna bring it out and pull it over your head like a hat? Right? So we can be active in this change and we can also be active on behalf of our sisters and brothers who are on the front lines in the sectors with highest emissions. Thank you. And uh, Christine, could you, uh, uh, I'd love to give you the closing uh, note. Tell us as individuals, what can we do uh, in investing our money in the right places? Sure. Yeah. So I was going to start with the, you know, your initial question, but I can switch it up. So, you know, I think I agree with David on a lot of the, the elements of, you know, what can we be doing? And then more specifically on what you do with your money, you know, what gets financed uh, really does determine the economy of the future. And, you know, something I think that through COVID and, and certainly Van City has um, been part of for decades is it's also who gets financed and how you think about that, right? So everyone's at a different starting point, organizations and people. Um, so know your starting point and then understand your levers, right? Again, if you're an organization, you have certain levers that you can pull. Some are stronger than others. Is it looking back at supply chain? Is it looking forward to, you know, for us, what do we finance? Is it um, your investment portfolio and how you think about that? So I think, you know, there are so many ways to approach that as individuals, uh, 
you know, we do have a voice, as it was said. And so demand better, right? Ask them, you know, what are you doing with my money? What is it financing? Who is it financing? And who is that ultimately helping? And I'd say finally, you know, really for all these pieces, we've all been talking about it. It is a systemic change, and that means you need the system to also change it. Um, so people do need to work together, um, government, private, public, and the individuals need to all come together to, to really see that change. Thank you so much. What a powerful conversation. Just want to thank you, Christine Bergeron, David Miller, and Samantha Smith for your time. Thank you.